thank you all. Thank you for the opportunity um, to, to speak with you today and to kind of share a, a message that, that I have put together called The Power of Partnership. And so many times as we go through our lives, whether we're talking personally or professionally, we forget about the power that can come through partnerships. Um, today, by the time I finish this presentation, what I want to do is offer up a gift to each one of you. And it's a gift that was given to me a couple years ago in a very interesting way, but it's a beautiful type of gift. It's one of those things that it never loses its value and it doesn't cost anything to give. So I'm, I'm anxious to, to give that to you at the end of this presentation. So today I'm here to talk to you about partnerships. And as I've already alluded to you, Partnerships is a really wide and broad term, and we have partnerships in our life that are both personally and professional, everything from our families to our neighbors to our coworkers, all around us, there are opportunities for us to partner. This brings me to my most favorite quote that I have, if you want to go fast, go alone, if you want to go far, go together. And this is something that I believe to my absolute core to be the way that we're supposed to live. It's a way that I tried to live. And going together specifically to me means going in partnership. You know, I firmly believe that, that all of us are put on earth and all of us have at least one amazing gift. And I have set out in my own life to find exactly what that gift or gifts are what those capabilities are, those resources, as I'll later refer to them, that I can bring to others to help make them become more of what they are trying to achieve. So let's start off by defining what a, what a partnership is. A lot of times in organizations and definitely in the business world, we talk about company A partnering with company B, or organization X partnering with organization Y. But really, what is a partnership? It is a relationship, right? It's a personal relationship. It always comes down to people. So the definition of a partnership is a relationship where two or more people, companies, or organizations trade resources in order to provide value to all entities that are involved. The basic Definition of a partnership. So I ask you, are you a member of a partnership? So we all are, right? With our spouses, with our children, with our neighbors, with people that we work with, we are surrounded by opportunities to partner, to trade resources, or to trade those competencies, those gifts, those expertise that we have in order to make the proverbial one plus one now equal three. But the important thing that we forget a lot of times is that in partnerships, in order to really leverage the power of partnerships, it's a genuine commitment to we and no longer me. And I must confess that I have a challenge with this. I think we all, whenever we're honest with ourselves, we're challenged by understanding that whenever we are a member or a party to a partnership, we're taking on a new level of a commitment where it's now about group success and not just my own personal success or my own personal self-interest. So whenever we talk about partnerships, it's pretty easy to get people to see the value in them. We all have said that we are members to partnerships, but what does this mean for us Let's, let's talk economically. Let, let's talk from a commercial perspective. So as, as a business consultant, as a business guy, I've been enamored with this topic for many, many years and have researched it at length um, and in multiple different scenes. And there was, uh, the largest study that was done was actually done by the, the Journal of Accountancy. And what they did is they looked at 2,000 companies so there's three ways, again, to speak kind of commercially or the business side of partnering, there's three ways to grow a business. There's organically, 
where within your company, you own all of your own resources, you hire your own individuals, your experts, and you do it all, quote unquote, in-house. That's organic growth. So that's kind of the default approach that all of us business leaders take. The second approach that we have to build our business is through acquisition. So we go out and we buy another company. We buy a firm, we take those, resource, those resources, and then we pull them into our company. And then we, we try to get them to multiply. And then the third way that we have to grow our business is through partnership. And so some researchers got together and they wanted to try to prove, disprove, at least shine some light on this whole partnership thing or the most efficient way to grow your business. And so they looked at 2,000 different companies, and each one of these companies had engaged in organic growth, an organic growth initiative, an acquisition growth initiative, and also a partnering initiative. And so what they found at the end of their research is there was actually a 50% higher return on investment through partnerships. It was nearly 17%. So as you think of 11% or upwards of 11.5% relative to almost 17, that is a significant difference whenever you're talking about you know, the revenues or the return for a company. So economically speaking, there's a huge business case, there's a strong business case for partnering. So as a business leader, a business professional, you say, awesome, let's go out and let's form a bunch of partnerships. We're really going to take advantage of this 50% thing. Well. The challenging news and the bad news that I have to share with you is that the success rate of business-to-business -business partnerships is estimated to only be somewhere between 25 and 35 percent. There have been hundreds of studies done on this over the years and dozens over just the past few years. The latest research that's out, Gardner, McKinsey, PricewaterhouseCoopers, they say that the success rate, depending on exactly how you define success of partnerships or what a partnership is, somewhere between 25 to 35 percent. That's horrible. That's horrific. Right? And so whenever I talk to business leaders about partnerships, I call it the great accelerator. So are there any fans of drag racing? All right, so... And in full disclosure, I'm not a huge drag racing fan, but I am absolutely amazed by the sport. So when I was 20, I actually took my little brother out to Heartland Park in Topeka, Kansas, and I wanted to see the power of these cars. Well, the fastest cars they have, they're called top fuel dragsters. So the car that I drove here, you know, drove in here today has... At best, what, 50 to 75 horsepower? These cars have 10,000 horsepower, right? They go from zero to 320 miles an hour in a quarter of a mile. And so whenever I talk about partnerships and being the great accelerator, that's, that's what I'm referring to. Partnerships have the, the opportunity to pull those new resources into organizations to accelerate growth. But the challenge is most of us don't know how to control or to steer the power of these 10,000 horsepower machines. So if we do know what we're doing, we hit the finish line really, really fast and it looks like a blur. If we don't know what we're doing, we hit the wall really, really fast and we see much more than a blur or maybe we don't see anything. Um, so we need to learn if we want to leverage the power of partnership we need to understand how to harness the power of those 10,000 horses. So let me ask you a question. This is a pop quiz I'm going to throw out real quick. So the new economy, what is the largest media provider in the world? Right? So we think of Viacom and a lot of these other brands that we hear. What's the, who, what's the largest media provider in the world today? Any guesses? Anybody know? Facebook. Okay, Jesse gets one point. Um, the largest hotel provider in the world. VRBO. Airbnb. Airbnb. 
Question number three. This is your last chance to get some points on the board. <laughs> Uber, the largest taxi provider in the world. Okay? So now let's put the, the partnership umbrella on this. The largest, if you could go back, please. The largest media provider in the world is Facebook. How much content does Facebook generate? How much content does, does Facebook produce and sell? Zero. The largest hotel provider, Airbnb. How many hotels does Airbnb own? How many taxi cabs does Uber own? How do they do it? The power of partnership. So the world that we live in now, the 21st generation economy, the 21st century economy, is going to be built based upon partnerships, but on partnerships in a way that we've never really seen before. This is one of my, my favorites that, that I start with whenever I do engagement with folks. So having a core competency in partnering enables a fast track to leverage a core competency in anything. I love this. So many times in organizations and so many times in business, we think about what is, what is our core competency? What do we do? And we're taught even in business school, what is our core competency? Let's focus on just that. But the problem is so many times in business, we get focused on the products and services of what our core competencies are, and we forget about the customers in the end. And I'm a firm believer that we need to make our customers and caring for our customers, we need to make that be our core competency. And by leveraging the power of partnership, we're now able to make anything become a core competency to our business, and we can do that through partnerships. So many of us in our, in our pockets right now, we have an iPhone. iPhones would not be in existence today if it wasn't for a partnership, a strategic partnership between AT&T uh, and Apple in 2006 and 2007. And by putting those two companies together, it absolutely revolutionized the telecommunications world and even the entertainment world, we can argue. So let me ask you this. What's the common theme here? So we have Borders Books. It happened in September of 2010. We have Blockbuster, February 2011, and then Kodak, January of 2012. They all went out of business. They all filed bankruptcy. So as a researcher, as a consultant, as just a curious business-minded person, I ask, why? Businesses go out, you know, file bankruptcy on a frequent basis, and it's sad. But then you look at it, you know, why? Well, with Borders Books, the leadership there thought that their core competency is logistics, and it's bringing physical books into their stores, putting them on shelves, and then selling them to people. And they thought that their customers wanted to buy books. But what they failed to realize is that the customers want to read. And so the technology ended up passing them by. There's this little company called Amazon that tried to partner with Borders in the early days. And the executives of Borders frequently said no. Finally, whenever they were on life support and had no other alternative, they finally built a partnership with Amazon, but it was too late. The executives at Borders failed to act with the courage and to adjust to the new economy to what their clients wanted. Blockbuster, this is an interesting one. So Blockbuster, they filed bankruptcy in February of 2011. So Netflix, a company that you might have heard of, some of the executives in 2000 flew down to Dallas to meet up with a senior leadership team from Blockbuster. And they asked them repeatedly to forge a partnership with them. So what was Blockbuster in the business of? So they started off at the VHS tapes, right? And then it graduated to DVDs and then this thing called Blu-rays. And there was kind of this evolution. But their world has always been in physical mediums 
that people come into their physical stores to rent. What they believed that people wanted was to rent movies. What they failed to realize is that people just want to watch movies, and they didn't adjust. So the folks from Netflix came down and said, hey, there's this new world called the internet, and you can download and stream this really cool stuff. We would love to partner with you. Let us build you a platform. You can stay in the physical world. We're going to go to the digital world, and we're going to help you set up this platform. They literally laughed at them. And later that year in 2000, the executives from Netflix said that we're going to try again. So they called down to Blockbuster and said, hey, I'm telling you, this download thing is real. We would like to sell our company to you for $50 million, and then we'll stay on board and help run the system. We'll show you guys how to revolutionize the world of home entertainment. They said no. In 2000, they offered to sell for $50 million. Today, Netflix is worth $80 billion. Kodak, this is actually my favorite. So Kodak has always, I mean, for generations, Kodak has been in the world of photography, physical photography, with paper, with all of the inks, all of the cameras, all of the other physical equipment that they sold. What was eventually the demise of Kodak? We have one in our pocket, most of us. The cell phone, which has a digital camera in it. Or as the digital camera that was eventually the demise of Kodak. But it didn't have to be. Who invented the digital camera? Kodak. A researcher at Kodak invented the digital camera that later led to the company's demise. Why? Because the leadership team there did not have the courage to step forward to understand truly what their customers want, but also to evolve with the time, and they definitely did not understand the power of partnership. So the future of business-to-business -business partnerships, um, Steve Case. So Steve was the, the, the co-founder of AOL, America Online, right? So America Online is uh, to blame uh, for bringing the, an, an amazing technology into so many of our homes, the internet, right? And so Steve, a couple years ago, had uh, published this book called The Third Wave. It's, it's an amazing, amazing read. And in The Third Wave, Steve talks about how in the 21st century economy, if businesses don't know how to partner, they're going to struggle at best. Because those companies, those organizations that do understand the power of partnership, they're going to achieve that multiplier effect. They're going to be able to harness those 10,000 horsepower and get that great acceleration. The statistics show that since 1985, the quantity of business-to-business -business partnerships is increasing at a rate of 25% per year. So there's a lot of people that are jumping into the top fuel drag car and trying to drive it. <laughs> but unfortunately, only 25 to 35% of them hit the finish line uh, before they hit the wall. But the future of partnerships is shared by Steve Case, and it's an amazing read. And actually, Steve uh, pulled a lot of his research from the Kauffman Foundation right here in Kansas City. So... Whenever I work with companies and I speak with business leaders, organizational leaders across the board, I set out years ago to try to answer the question, what are the keys to partnership success? And in doing research and in looking at literally hundreds of studies, but then also performing my own research, talking to 106 executives across the country, from the likes of Google, Microsoft, all the way down the spectrum to smaller businesses, I wanted to ask them and to pull those insights so that I could share them on what are the foundational elements, what are the imperatives to partnership success. And so I've built something called, that I call the, the partnership success pyramid that shares these different elements. So the first element, as you could imagine, is trust. And so whenever we talk about the definition of a partnership, 
What are the first two words? A relationship. So all of our relationships rely on trust. And trust is the absolute foundation of all of our relationships. Several years ago, I don't know if there's any Stephen Covey fans in the room, but I'm a huge Covey fan, uh, senior and junior, all of their work. I think it just makes a ton of sense. But Covey wrote a book called The Speed of Trust. And I thought it was impossible to write 364 pages on a single word. Covey proved me wrong. So The Speed of Trust is all about how to build high trust organizations. And to synthesize the book, Covey says that trust is a great economic engine. And what he means by that is organizations that have high levels of trust, they spend a very small amount of time, if any time, validating the information that they're given. So that leaves them the maximum amount of time to execute, to get results. So high value and high trust organizations high trust partnerships, one of the great ways that they are able to achieve superior performance, superior results, is because they don't have to spend the time or waste the time to validate all the information that they're given. The second element is alignment. So alignment, we're specifically talking about vision, mission, and core values. And I would call those three culture, Right? Vision, mission, core values, call that culture. And then the fourth element is goals. Where do you want to go? Where do you want to achieve? Whenever we're looking at partnerships, whether we're talking about within our own organization, within our own business, or whenever we're talking about business-to-business partnerships, having alignment is an absolute imperative. Having the cultural connection and the cultural alignment, it starts there. I was frankly shocked and amazed whenever I was pouring through research and how many times I come across studies or authors that suggested culture doesn't matter whenever you're talking about two businesses working together. I think culture is everything. Culture is so important. But the second imperative, alignment of vision, mission, core values, alignment of that culture, and then the next element is to go to goals. You have, to be, you have to want to go to the same exact place. Jim Collins, Good to Great. We've all probably heard of that book. It's, it's, it's wonderful. In Jim's book, he, he mostly talks about like a company or an, an organization. But he uses the, the proverbial be on the bus, the right seat, right bus, going in the right direction. Absolutely true for business, but it also extends to our partnerships as well. Whenever we partner with other organizations, we want to make sure that we keep alignments with them. The third element, transparency. And this really speaks to communications. And there's three different elements to transparency. Clear, honest, and timely. So many times in life, in our personal lives, also in business, we're not really clear about what we want and what we expect and what we feel that we need. Transparency speaks to having clear expectations set of what we are willing to bring to the table as a resource, but also what we expect to receive from those that we partner with. Being very honest, being very bold in what we believe, to share that information. And then the third element is timely. Unfortunately, in all relationships and in all partnerships that we have, sometimes we have to be the bearer of bad news. But one of the greatest things that we can do is to bring that information forward in a very timely manner. Because what that allows us to do, it allows our partners to have maximum amount of time to make adjustments to minimize the adverse effects of whatever that bad news is. The fourth imperative Esprit de corps. So you're going to have to forgive me. So this is the Marine Corps coming out in me a little bit. But esprit de corps, it's a, it's a French term, which means spirit of the group. And specifically what it means, I'll translate, it means commitment. But a commitment to we, not, not to me as an individual of what I want out of this partnership. But it's truly uh, an, a, an a willingness 
to take one step back so that your partner can take two steps forward. It's a, it's a commitment to work together to get maximum results. Are there any Simon Sinek fans here? I'm a huge Simon Sinek fan. Um, I don't have a man crush on anybody, but if I did, Simon Sinek would probably be my dude. Uh, I love his work. Um, you might have uh, heard of Leaders Eat Last. Leaders Eat Last was a book that he wrote, and he never spent any time in the military, but he was fascinated by, by the military and, and by the people in the military. Make very little wages, they're flown and they live all across the world, a lot of times away from their family members, and they put themselves in the worst conditions all the time at a second's notice, and they're willing at any time to give up their life for the men and women that are to their right and left. But then we look at these huge corporate executives that are out there, and they have a very different approach. And, and a lot of times in, in Simon's work with Leaders Eat Last, he talks about how those leaders are, are looking out for self-interest. But whenever we look at the nation's military, they have a very different approach. And, and the core difference is the commitment to each other. An absolute imperative. And finally, that brings us to results. The fifth and final element. That's the whole reason that we engage in partnerships and different organizations is to accomplish goals, to get results out of it. In order for us to get results, if we have esprit de corps, if we have commitment, if we have good, transparent communications, if we're aligned with those that we partner with, we can quickly build a solid base of trust, and that's what enables the great results. So, long-term success. That is what we're really after, getting results. Your company's core competency shouldn't be your products or services. It should be delivering results for your customers. We don't want to be a Borders Books. We don't want to be a Blockbuster. And we don't want to be a Kodak. So what does that take? We need to be able to push ourselves, be willing to jump out, and to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. To take those risks, to take those challenges, and to realize that we always have to be growing. You know, so many times in business, we want to stick with what's comfortable, or we say, we got to go with what got us there. But in the 21st century economy, one thing is sure, and that has changed. And so we have to act with courage and conviction and confidence as we do that. So I want to share a story with you real quick. And it's, it's a personal story that has helped put me on the journey that, that I'm on right now. So several years ago, when I started my company, Fidelis One, um, I had stepped down the path of doing operations work. So by education, I, I'm, I'm an efficiency freak. I'm an economist by initial education. And business operations is something that, that's just the way that my brain is wired. So when I knew I wanted to get into consulting and uh, to start to work with business leaders, I went into the world of operations and business operations. But it wasn't my real passion. And honestly, it wasn't even what I felt was my true calling. But when I was honest with myself, I didn't have the confidence or the conviction to go do what I felt that I was meant to do. I would periodically meet with various business mentors. And I'd explain to them this, this idea that I had to have a business that focused on partnerships and to help companies do what I had done for a Fortune 100 company for over 13 years. Form, build, develop, and lead these huge, huge corporations in their partnerships. And I was given a gift. So when I was nine months old, my dad died. 
My father died in a car accident. And so as I grew up, I frequently wondered what it would be like to talk to him. And I wondered what life would be like if he was here today, right? My mom um, remarried uh, after, you know, after my dad had passed, so I, I only know my stepdad as my dad as the father figure. So I, I can't, it's hard for me to even imagine what it would be like having my biological father. And a couple years ago, I had a dream. And in my dream, I talked to my dad. And as you can imagine, it was, just, it was a very surreal experience. But he asked me if I had any regrets. And I'm one of those type of people that I, mean, I like to live life to its fullest. And I, I totally believe in not living with regret. If you want to do it, go do it, and then figure out the consequences to the extent there are some after the fact, right? I mean, literally, I've skydived, I've scuba dived, and kind of everything in between, and done a whole lot of other things that adrenaline junkies do that I probably shouldn't have done. Definitely wasn't safe. That whole 10,000 horsepower thing, that, that kind of flashes through my mind. If I could have had the opportunity, I would have been crazy enough to try it. But there was one thing that I didn't have the courage to do that was the one regret that I had for this conversation, and that is I didn't have a business, I didn't have the courage to have the business to go help people, to help business leaders form more successful partnerships. And once I told my dad that, he stuck out his hand and said, do you see this grain of sand? And I said, yes. And he said, do you believe in God? And I said, yes. He said, do you believe in eternity? I said, yes. And he said, this grain of sand represents your life on earth. For some people, it's 50 years, some it's 70, some it's over 100. For my dad, for your grandpa, it was 90 years. For me, it was only 27. But let's say this grain of sand represents your life and you live to be the age of your grandpa, it represents 90 years. Now think about all the sand on all the beaches, in all of the deserts, all over the world, and every one of those grains of sand represents 90 years. All of that time does not even start to compare to what eternity is. You only have one life to live. You don't know if it's going to end whenever you wake up. You don't know if you're going to live to be 100. But one thing is certain, it is short. You have one life to live, live with no regrets. And that was it. And I'd never had a dream about him before then, and I've never had a dream about him since then. But it immediately changed my mindset and my framework. The very next day, <laughs> I set out to build the foundations for Partnernomics, the book that, uh, that I published and released. And I've frequently thought back, I mean, was, was that real? You know, it was a dream, but was, was the message real or was I just kind of hallucinating in my sleep? And I didn't tell anybody about this dream. My siblings, not even my wife, not my mom. I didn't tell anybody about it until recently. And um, so when I decided that I was going to, to share that, because I truly feel like it was a gift, whenever I decided to share that, I spoke to my wife and I spoke to my mom. And my mom said, man, that's, that's, that's wild but in a different sort of a way. And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, well, I think there's more to it than, than what you know. Well, come to find out, my dad uh, started a company in the early 70s. And it was one of those businesses, it was kind of like wireless telecommunications was in the 90s. I mean, it was just going to, to blossom and explode. It was just a matter of being there to grab hold of the rocket. 
In the early 70s, he had started a business and it was taking off in a phenomenal way. My dad had been on his own since he was 13. And if there's one thing that he hated, it was owing somebody else. He never liked to borrow or use money from somebody else. He didn't like having that hang over his head. And so in order for him to fully take advantage of this opportunity, he was going to have to borrow money. Usually for entrepreneurs, that's the hardest thing, is getting somebody willing to loan them money. He quickly found an investor that was ready to put money into, into his business. But he didn't have the courage. He didn't have the confidence to borrow the money to form the business. And I think for the 42 years, 40 plus years that I've been on earth, I think my dad has been watching me. And he knows how passionate I am about this. But he wanted to give me the gift to tell me not to live with regrets, not to turn out like him in the sense of having a great opportunity and a great passion before you, but not having the confidence to, to act upon that. And so I want to part with you today by sharing that gift, and I hope that it resonates with you. I have found an incredible amount of value with, with having that and constantly being reminded. In our daily lives, we, we face a lot of scary things, but in the grand scheme of things, it's one grain of sand to all the sand on all the beaches and all the deserts. It's really, really small. So acting with the, the courage and the confidence to do that, but also never forgetting that if we want to go far, we need to go together. We go together in partnership. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll share a couple quick things, maybe. So I've um, recently been turned on to some really, really cool resources, because I'm trying to figure this thing out, right? I think we all are trying to figure this thing out. So I've, through our growth group, um, Tiffany and I watched uh, The Shack. I tried to make it through the audio book, and the first half just kind of, I got stalled out on it, but we watched the movie. Man, it's just wild. So I was talking with Jim about how interesting life is and, and, and how many opportunities we have if we just have our eyes open. And I, I feel like for the last f at least 40 years, I've, I've gone through life with my eyes mostly shut. But uh, whenever he had a chance to talk to his dad in heaven, there's just so much symbolism that, that happened from there, uh, from that movie, but just so many other resources that I've been digging into to, to really kind of really solidify and clarify the, the purpose you know, that, that I feel that I have. But yeah, if anybody has any questions, I, I realize it's more business related, but hopefully you could pull a couple of nuggets out of there that, you know, it's really, it's relationships and how we work with other people. Well, I do have a yes, sir. Yeah, I absolutely do feel that, and I've, whenever I've engaged with different, I mean, honestly, it's mostly CEO groups or business leadership groups, but even I, I, I spoke to a group of executive um, recruiters, and they had mentioned how valuable, what I call the partnership success pyramid, um, how valuable that would be to pull in candidates, to pull in the executive leaders, and to have that open dialogue, have that open communication about the importance of trust, alignment, transparency, esprit de corps, AKA commitment, to get results. So one of the things that, that I share, and I tell people if they get nothing out of Partneronomics, my book, look at chapter two, read it, and whenever you are going to form your next partnership, just 
use the Partnership Success Pyramid as a framework for that conversation. Because if you don't have those five elements, so many times in partnerships, we just want the resource. In, in business, we talk about, I just need that developer. I just need that, that supply chain. I just need access to your customers. But we don't forget about the other 80% that has to be there in order for partnerships to work. So, yes. Good. Yeah. 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 Abs no question. No question. And that's why I said that's my favorite quote. If you want to go fast, go alone. But who cares about going fast if if you're not getting what you want? And and I truly feel that. I mean, the, the valuable life is, is the life of us being together and working in community, but leveraging the great gifts and talents that everybody has. But it's so easy in the technology life that we live now to, to get so isolated in our own little cocoon that we forget about all the opportunities to partner. We forget about the power of partnership. Thank you for that. Yes, sir. Yeah, I truly believe what you're saying, and I think to, to advance that maybe a little bit further is we have to step out. So, so you have to forgive me because I'm, I'm, I'm a business dude, but we talk about commodities, right? Commodities, what are commodities? It's where you just fight over price, and what we try to get businesses to think about is to go over to what we call the collaborative side. In marketing, they call it differentiation. But any time that we try to differentiate, what does that require? Change. What does require? What, what does change require? It requires a leap of faith. And so many of us, and I'm guilty of it on a daily basis, I, I still don't live as free or as fearful as I would like to be. But we can, I, I truly believe in your point that each one of us can, can play a huge role to change the world, to make it better for people. But it requires, I think, all of us to get out of our comfort zone, which is not natural. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Sincerely.